Father Cleopa Elias said that believing in the theory of reincarnation is a form of madness, paganism, and a deviation from truth. This statement may sound harsh, but it reflects the view of the Church of Christ on the theory of reincarnation. One of the fundamental tenets of Christianity involves elucidating the beliefs surrounding the afterlife, the judgment of souls, and the resurrection of the dead. Intimately connected to these doctrines is the relentless battle against the fallacies propagated by the theory of reincarnation, which poses a significant threat and regrettably manages to influence the minds of present-day believers. No other deviation is as readily accepted by the faithful as the belief in reincarnation. This can be easily understood from a certain perspective. While Orthodox Christian believers readily accept certain teachings of the Church, such as the perpetual virginity of the Theotokos, they tend to have less certainty about the fate of the soul after death. It is important to recognize that despite considering themselves Christian, those who believe in reincarnation are considered separated from the body of Christ and are condemned according to church doctrine. The reasons why the church strongly condemns the theory of reincarnation and those who adhere to it, which will be presented here, may not convince those who have been deceived to abandon their error. One concerning aspect of our time is that, despite the desire for a pure life and salvation, many believers have fallen into the trap of embracing this Eastern belief. However, it is important to note that those who believe in reincarnation are separated from Christ. They may unknowingly belong to the New Age movement of apostasy, even if they have not consciously recognized the serious nature of this deviation. Here are five common reasons why Christians may believe in reincarnation. They doubt the Church possesses the complete truth of faith. They are not aware about the sinful nature of embracing such a heresy. They think erroneously that there is evidence in Holy Scripture supporting the idea of reincarnation. They do not find a more satisfactory explanation for the suffering experienced by many individuals, which leads them to believe in the concept of facing consequences from past lives. They believe that the idea of reincarnation, which provides the opportunity to correct mistakes in future lives, is more aligned with a loving God than the notion of a punishing God who condemns people to eternal torment. Many people who find themselves in different deviant beliefs may be unaware that their beliefs differ from those taught by Christ or may not fully understand the consequences of their doubts regarding certain church teachings. When presented with a choice between a God who saves all people and a God who only allows a small portion into heaven while condemning the rest to hell, it is understandable that one would prefer the former. In the New Testament, the image of Christ, the Son of God, willingly sacrificing himself out of love for humanity, is clear. Could Christ be so severe as to withhold his loving mercy even from those in hell? It is not wise to give a hasty answer to such a question. Humans can understand their own actions, but the fate of the soul after death surpasses our comprehension. We are not God, so we do not fully understand what is best, and therefore we can only accept things as God has ordained them to be. It is undeniable that if God could have saved all people, then he would have done so, and hell would have been empty instantly. God initially created humans with the intention that all would attain heaven, but humanity's choice of sin disrupted this plan. And if God granted us this freedom, it means that it couldn't have been otherwise. The God of the Church is not arbitrary, playing with human destinies and choosing to either delight or torment them for eternity. 
if God created humanity with the ability to freely choose sin and suffer its consequences, then it must be for the best, even if we are not able to understand fully why. The fact that God has given us freedom indicates that we have the capacity to ignore Him and drift away. It is challenging for the human mind to comprehend why God does not employ less severe means to persuade people to obey Him, or why He does not find ways to save everyone. In His omniscience, God did not desire for humans to be His slaves. God's purpose in creating man was not driven by any personal need or desire for servitude. The act of creation was an expression of God's love with the intention of enabling humanity to experience everlasting communion with Him. True joy, just like love, can only be expressed and felt within the confines of a soul that is free to choose. It is impossible to find a medication that can bring joy to the soul or a drug that can evoke true feelings of love. If one's soul resists opening up to God, there will be consequences that they must bear as a result of that choice. While God cannot compel anyone to be saved against their will, He tries every possible means to save us. The ultimate act of His love for humanity is demonstrated through the sacrificial death of His Son, Jesus Christ, on the cross, who bore the weight of our sins. Now it is the responsibility of humans to respond to God's love. Depending on this response, they will either find happiness or face eternal condemnation. Those who uphold the belief in universal salvation for all, regardless of whether they lived a righteous life or died unrepentant, known as apocatastasis, contradict the teachings of Holy Scripture. Undoubtedly, this condemned theory has spread in the 20th century, particularly in contexts where the love for worldly desires has overshadowed the love for virtue. Richard J. Buckham, an observer of the Protestant environment, made an observation regarding the belief in eternal punishment in hell among Christian theologians. He noted that until the 19th century, this belief was upheld by nearly all theologians and considered an essential aspect of universal Christian doctrine, much like the teachings on the Trinity and the Incarnation. However, since around 1800, there has been a significant shift and the abandonment of this traditional teaching has been widespread. Today, there are fewer theologians who support the notion of eternal punishment and among the more progressive thinkers, the acceptance of universal salvation, either as a hopeful concept or as an established doctrine, is so widespread that many theologians simply assume it without requiring further evidence. In a description of a charismatic service, there is a fragment recounting an experience where the preacher spoke about hell. Surprisingly, Instead of evoking seriousness or contemplation, the people in attendance responded with laughter. This occurrence, although associated with charismatic groups, is not limited to them, as the mocking of the teaching about hell can be found in various other so-called Christian groups as well. In the Western world, there is a noticeable trend towards embracing the notion of collective salvation, wherein the concept of eternal hell is not seen as a reality. This growing acceptance can be viewed as an initial step towards accepting the theory of reincarnation. It is evident that New Age thinking heavily relies on the appealing concept of salvation for all, which resonates with those seeking liberation from eternal suffering. The Orthodox Church prefers the truth above all else. Even if the truth may be unpleasant, similar to the taste of bitter medicine, it is the only path that leads to salvation. Throughout history, the doctrine of apocatastasis has faced repeated condemnation. For example, the council held in Constantinople 
in 553 issued a decree stating that anyone who believes in the notion of pre-existence of souls and the condemned concept of restoration, apocatastasis, where all things would be restored to their original state, should be anathematized. Similarly, there are other instances where the teaching of apocatastasis has been explicitly denounced for asserting that the punishment of demons and sinful humans is not eternal, but rather that it will eventually come to an end and everyone will be restored to happiness. The belief in reincarnation is closely tied to the concept of the pre-existence of souls. According to the teachings of the Church, human souls were not created from the beginning of the world, nor are they divine sparks or fragments of divinity. The soul, being created by God, cannot be a detached part of the Creator. Only those who confuse creation with the Creator and support old pantheistic ideas hold such beliefs. According to God's divine plan, the soul comes into existence at the moment of the formation of the human embryo, where it will ultimately dwell. In this way, the developing fetus is the fruit of parental love, and it is impossible for a soul to have the freedom to independently incarnate or exist independently of parents. In both the theory of reincarnation and the theory of the pre-existence of the soul, a direct implication can be observed. If the soul exists independently from parents and experiences multiple lives with different sets of parents, the uniqueness of the parent-child relationship disappears. Reincarnation leads to the erosion of the fundamental bond of love between parents and children, which serves as the foundation of the family. In Hindu society, certain strong traditions have managed to maintain a close connection between parents and children, despite the belief in reincarnation. However, in contemporary society, which tends to resist traditionalism, the belief in reincarnation often gives rise to intense conflicts between generations. Young people make great efforts to assert their independence from those they no longer perceive as their true parents. The social implications of this Eastern belief are not the most significant. Rather, it is the spiritual implications that hold greater weight. Those who embrace the concept of reincarnation disregard the Church's teachings on the judgment of souls and the resurrection of the dead. Because many people still believe they have discovered evidence of reincarnation in Holy Scripture, and thereby deny that they are in error, it is worthwhile to briefly examine the texts that are inspired by God. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear His voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish! What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable, it is raised imperishable. Your dead will live, their bodies will rise. 
I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. It is appropriate to add the resolute affirmation of the resurrection, which can be found by anyone seeking to understand the biblical teaching on this matter. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophecy to these bones and say to them, I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then the Lord said to me, Prophecy to the breath, prophecy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says, Come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them, they came to life, and stood up on their feet, a vast army. The above quotes are highly explicit and provide sufficient evidence for those who want to learn the biblical teachings on the afterlife, as well as to refute the notion of reincarnation. The resurrection of Christ stands in direct contradiction to this erroneous belief. Nevertheless, those opposing the truth have not hesitated to distort the biblical text to support their own ideas. The passages most commonly cited by them are the ones related to St. John the Baptist, whom they consider to be the reincarnation of the prophet Elijah, and the account of the man born blind which prompted the disciples to ask Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. From this passage, heretics derive the conclusion that the reason why the man was born blind is because of sins he committed in a previous life. However, if that were true, then Christ would have straightforwardly stated, this man is suffering because of the sins from his previous life. The Son of God never lied, and he had no reasons to deny the truth. He became human to reveal the secrets of salvation to mankind. Now let's shift our focus to the highly debated passage concerning St. John the Baptist, which is often mentioned by advocates of the theory of reincarnation. Verily I say to you, among them that are born of women, there has not arisen a greater than John the Baptist. And if you will receive it, this is Eliah, which was for to come. The text is short and precise. Who can argue that Saint Eliah was reincarnated in John the Baptist? How does holy tradition, which denies reincarnation, distort these words of Christ? Question those who are soiled by the mud of error. If there were favorable references to the theory of reincarnation in just one fragment of the New Testament, then it would be clear that the Church's teaching is contrary to the truth. But before rushing to assert such a thing, let us see if the theory of reincarnation can be supported by the previous fragment. First of all, in order for St. Elijah to be reincarnated, he first had to die. There is no mention in the Holy Scripture about the death of St. Elijah. Rather, there is a description of his ascent to heaven in a chariot of fire, pulled by horses. If we consider the possibility that St. Elijah was indeed reincarnated as St. John the Baptist, 
it would imply that during the transfiguration of Christ on Mount Tabor, St. John the Baptist should have been present alongside the prophet Moses instead of St. Elijah, Since St. John was considered greater than anyone born of women, he wouldn't have needed to conceal his true identity. Indeed, it was St. John the Baptist who baptized Christ. If he had indeed been St. Elijah in his most recent reincarnation, he would not have appeared as Elijah on Mount Tabor. According to Holy Tradition, the explanation for the above scriptural passage is that when the Savior indicated that St. John the Baptist is Elijah, he was emphasizing the prophetic gift and the impactful preaching of truth with which St. John was blessed. The aim was to convince the disciples of the significance of the message delivered by the forerunner. Those who claim to have discovered indications of reincarnation in the passage concerning St. John must now admit that they have been misled. It is evident that those who hastily interpret specific fragments of the Gospel based on their own opinions, or worse, under the influence of the devil, fall prey to deception. They are not interested in understanding the teachings of Holy Scripture, but rather in using it to support their own erroneous beliefs. Had their genuine intention been to embrace the truth conveyed in the Gospel, they would understand that each individual only has one earthly life and that all the deceased will rise again. The gravity of the deviation among those who believe in reincarnation becomes even more pronounced when there are priests attempting to establish connections between this heresy and the Church's teachings. The number of Orthodox clergy affected by this virus, or rather former Orthodox clergy, is very small. However, the situation is more serious when it comes to Catholic priests. Their openness to reincarnation ranges from mere flirtation with the idea to theological justifications. Once the possibility of reincarnation is accepted, even if only as a hypothesis worthy of consideration, we move further away from the teachings of the Holy Fathers and find ourselves closer to the one who sows doubt, the devil. Father Andreas Rech from the Alphonsian Academy in Rome declares that the challenge the Church encounters concerning reincarnation lies in the apparent elimination of personal uniqueness under this doctrine. With each new birth, the individual transforms into a different person who retains no memories of their previous existence. This raises the question of whether the core of personality resides in the body or the soul inhabiting it. Furthermore, there is the issue of reincarnation predicting a form of ultimate resurrection where one is liberated from the need for further reincarnations and attains the Absolute. Consequently, the mediation of Christ is removed as salvation is achieved solely through oneself without requiring external assistance. These are the dilemmas at hand. Nevertheless, it is worth considering whether reincarnation could be harmonized with the Catholic Church by interpreting it as a form of perfection, in the sense that the Catholics understand purgatory, which among other things means perfection. On a personal level, Father Rech finds the topic of reincarnation intriguing due to the substantial number of individuals worldwide who believe in it. He considers that engaging in dialogue with them is crucial in reaffirming the shared beliefs which are more extensive than one may realize. Another similar view expressed by the spokesperson of the Archbishop of Canterbury is that there are no official Christian views on this matter. It is widely known that the Church has firmly rejected the notion of reincarnation for a considerable period of time. Moreover, no compelling evidence has surfaced since then to prompt a reassessment of this topic. If such evidence were to come to light, it is likely that it would be carefully considered. However, given the present circumstances, the existing evidence can only be classified as unproven at best. 
These are two interesting ideas specific to the Western world. Even though the Church previously condemned certain heresies, it no longer holds any official positions regarding them today. And if compelling evidence were to emerge challenging the teachings of the Church, there is a possibility of adjusting those teachings accordingly. This particular approach to the matter is commonly observed among individuals who have departed from holy tradition. In the pursuit of establishing a connection with the numerous individuals who are misguided and in an attempt to find questionable common beliefs, there is a risk of opening doors to erroneous ideas. And to these millions of people, the devil has provided a bunch of seemingly compelling evidence supporting reincarnation, evidence that shows those weak in faith that the teachings of the church are wrong. Here is an example. An Indian girl claimed to have memories of her past life as Suda. She vividly recalled a horrifying event that took place on October 5, 1978, when her daughter was one year old. According to her, her husband and a nurse killed her, strangling her to death. When faced with recounting the scene, Menu became filled with terror and tears welled up in her eyes. The memories continued as she shared that in an attempt to dispose of her body, the perpetrators placed it inside the trunk and loaded it onto a train, intending to discard it in the Ganges River during the train's crossing. However, fate intervened and instead of reaching the river, the trunk fell from the train onto a bridge where it was spotted and opened. Consequently, the body was discovered and the doctor involved was sentenced to life imprisonment for the murder. Apart from this detailed narrative, Menu provided many details about her previous life, including her father's name and other family members. The story quickly circulated and eventually reached Suda's father, who wasted no time in visiting the village of Bethar to meet the girl believed to be the reincarnation of his unfortunate daughter. As soon as Menu saw him, she instantly recognized him and warmly embraced him. Since then, she had formed a strong bond with him and affectionately referred to him as her father. Later, the girl was taken to Kampur, and during their journey across the Ganges Bridge, she accurately pointed out the exact location where the trunk containing her assumed previous body had fallen. Upon arriving in Kampur, Menu managed to locate the street and house where she immediately recognized her mother, siblings, sister-in-law, various relatives and friends. Additionally, she identified her personal belongings, clothes, and even the guitar she used to play in her alleged previous life. The aforementioned case is one that deserves careful examination. It is worth noting that many individuals who have claimed to remember certain things from past lives, whether in normal or hypnotic states, were unable to provide accurate details regarding the locations they claimed to have inhabited. When it comes to the memories brought forth during hypnosis, there are legitimate concerns. It is suspected that the information provided by the personality supposedly evoked from previous lives is influenced by the knowledge existing during the time of the hypnosis session within the global culture. While this information may initially align with reality, it often gets refuted by subsequent findings raising doubts about the authenticity of these so-called previous lives. Jan Wilson's book Reincarnation delves into various cases that highlight these concerns. One particular case examines a claimed personality who lived during the rule of Pharaoh Ramses III. However, a notable discrepancy arises as the mentioned individual refers to the pharaoh's residence using the name Thebes, given by the Greeks much later, rather than the accurate name used during that time, which recent discoveries confirm as no. Additionally, it is widely known that ordinal numbers were not traditionally associated with pharaoh's names in ancient Egypt. The name Ramses III 
was assigned by Egyptologists in the past century for historical clarity. Another case highlighted in Jan Wilson's work involves an individual who claimed to have lived in North America during the 11th century and witnessed the Viking invasion. In their recollection, the Vikings were described as wearing horned helmets. However, recent discoveries indicate that the Vikings did not actually use horned helmets in battle, but rather reserved them solely for religious rituals. Their helmets in combat were conical in shape. Curiously, the historical knowledge possessed by the person undergoing hypnotic regression influenced the depiction of the personality evoked from nine centuries ago. These details serve to illustrate that the previous personalities heavily rely on the knowledge and beliefs of the present individual, giving rise to significant doubts regarding the accuracy of the method. Despite the considerable attention hypnosis attracts with its supporters asserting its unquestionable objectivity, there remains a limited awareness regarding the criticism surrounding this subject. Dr. Larry Garrett, an American hypnotist who has worked extensively with over 500 patients using the technique of regression hypnosis, discovered that the recollections of the subjects were often flawed even in relation to ordinary everyday events. During hypnosis, individuals frequently blend their memories with elements of the imagination. As Dr. Larry Garrett observed, it is quite common for people to come up with various details stemming from their desires, fantasies, and dreams. Those experienced in hypnosis and regression techniques often find that people have such a vivid imagination that they are willing to fabricate anything that pleases the hypnotist. Expressing a similar perspective, Alan Spraget, another researcher of hypnotic regression, noted the numerous risks accompanying this method. The most significant of these risks arise from the unconscious tendency of the human mind towards dramatic fantasy. What emerges during hypnosis can just as well be a dream about a previous existence the subject wished or believed to have lived. Under the guidance of a psychologist, a group of subjects were placed in a hypnotic state and instructed to recall their past lives. Surprisingly, without any exceptions, each member of the group was able to create accounts of their previous existence. Some of the accounts obtained in this way were remarkably detailed and convincingly vivid. However, in a subsequent session, when rehypnotized, Every participant managed to link all the initially provided details of their past lives to mundane sources, a person known from childhood, scenes from books or movies encountered years earlier, and other similar influences. Jean Priot, a researcher of memories believed to be connected to past lives, pointed out an intriguing observation. According to Priot, the idea of reincarnation tends to appeal to individuals who may feel disappointed in their ordinary lives. These individuals often claim to have lived in renowned and well-known civilizations such as Rome, Greece, Egypt, India or Tibet, countries for which there is a general familiarity. However, rarely do they make claims of past lives in lesser known lands like Koresmia, Atropaten or Arachosia real lands known only by scholars. Prio questions why individuals are consistently drawn to past lives as a Florentine rather than considering the possibility of being Masagiti or Aragonese instead. The Masagiti and Cherushchi were real historical groups, so Prio asks why they wouldn't be reincarnated. Back to the case of Little Menu, we can say we are no longer discussing charlatanism. The perplexing question arises, how could this little girl know so many details about Suda's life if she were not in fact the reincarnation of Suda herself? The appropriate answer to this can be provided by those who possess thorough knowledge of both church teachings and the complexities surrounding demonic manifestations as presented in the lives of the saints. 
Here we witness instances where demon-possessed people spoke in languages they had never learned. They shared intimate and accurate knowledge about the lives of those around them, information they could have only known if they had been physically present. However, here we also see how through repeated exorcisms these people experienced healing. They subsequently lost the ability to speak in the languages used by the devil through them and ceased to possess knowledge about the pasts of others. As the rich experience of the Church's battle against the forces of darkness shows, and as the fathers of our time unanimously testify, all instances of past life memories are in fact instances of demonic possession. While this conclusion may appear overly simplistic to those seeking paranormal explanations, it is deemed as the truth. It is worth noting that even Indian masters, who, being deceived by the devil, believe in reincarnation for different reasons, harbor reservations regarding the extensively publicized casuistry. Sri Somasundara de Sika Paramacharya, for instance, communicated his skepticism to Jan Stevenson, stating that the 300 cases studied do not serve as evidence for reincarnation. Instead, he asserts that they are all instances of spiritual possessions, a perspective that scholars in southern India have largely neglected. Even though they may not recognize that the spirits entering other bodies are actually demonic entities and instead believe them to be the spirits of the dead, there are some Eastern masters who can still observe that these cases involve nothing but possession. To support this assertion, two compelling cases will be presented that bear similarities to the situation of little Menum. One such case is that of Lurancy Venum, which showcases an even more prominent example of possession. For several months, and only sporadically thereafter, the personality of Mary Roth, who had passed away when Lurancy was merely one year old, completely took over the little girl's personality and inhabited her body. After that time had elapsed, Mary Roth withdrew and Lurancy returned to her normal self. While Mary Roth occupied Lurancy's body, she claimed to have temporarily occupied the available body of Lurancy Venom. In the spring of 1954, an Indian boy named Jasbir, at the age of three and a half, fell seriously ill with smallpox and slipped into a coma, leading his parents to believe he had died. To their astonishment, a few hours later, he regained consciousness and eventually made a full recovery. However, something peculiar had changed about Jasbir. After a few weeks, he began exhibiting a completely different behavior. He started to claim that he was a Brahmin named Sobaram, who had died at the age of 22 on May 22, 1954, which coincided with the period when Jasbir had fallen ill. What made the situation even more unusual was the fact that a different voice seemed to speak through Jasbir, claiming to belong to the spirit of Sobaram. According to this voice, after Sobaram's death, a sadhu, a holy man, advised him to enter Jasbir's body. The possibility of Jasbir being the reincarnation of Sobaram can be dismissed on the grounds that Sobaram died three years after Jasbir was born. Instead, it is more likely that Jasbir was possessed by the devil who posed as Sobaram, similarly to how little Menu was possessed by the one who posed as Suda. In summary, based on the examination of these cases, we can state that there are three situations. 1. Cases of simple deception when the memories are a fabrication of the person's imagination, particularly those revived through hypnosis. 2. When memories inspired by the devil contradict actual historical or geographical facts. 3. Situations when the memories are correct from a historical and geographical view, suggesting partial or rarely complete possession by a demonic entity. If the first two situations fail to support the existence of past lives, the third case, and the only one worth considering, 
serves as a test for those whose faith is weak. However, individuals with weak faith would be better off sticking to the teachings of the Church and the examples set by the saints, even if they have some doubts, rather than embracing heretical beliefs based on the same doubts. This advice applies not only to the belief in reincarnation, but also to any situation where faith wavers. When discussing reincarnation, it is important to recognize the differences in understanding between Eastern cultures and New Age authors. François Brun, a former Catholic priest, points out the significant differences between Western esoteric beliefs and Buddhist and Hindu traditions. The West did not simply adopt Eastern ideas without question as the cultural differences were too profound. Brun highlights Rudolf Steiner's system, which diverges from the Indian approach of gradual purification. Instead, Steiner's system focuses on personal progress and enrichment rather than stripping away aspects of oneself. Furthermore, Steiner's and Alec Kardec's synthesis of reincarnation is Christ-centered. In this perspective, Christ takes on and resolves the cosmic consequences of all our mistakes, while also providing the necessary strength for individuals to overcome their karmic burdens. New Age authors apparently recognize the significance of Christ, but in reality they spread teachings that conflict with the Christian faith. Because the Eastern understanding of reincarnation under the law of karma is too cold and harsh for Christian environments, a more appealing alternative was introduced. This alternative presents reincarnation as a journey of spiritual growth where individuals gain knowledge of eternal truths and elevate themselves to higher spiritual realms. In this view, the purpose of another life on earth is no longer seen as a means of atonement for past mistakes, but rather an opportunity for freely chosen progress. Additionally, New Age authors introduce the idea of progression from a lower realm to a higher one, starting from the mineral realm and advancing through the plant, animal, human, and ultimately the superhuman realm. According to this perspective, reincarnation appears as an essential stage for human beings to understand their divine nature and ultimately reach the level of superhuman. According to the neo-pagan understanding, the idea of future reincarnation is not necessarily viewed as negative, but rather as a path towards spiritual growth. When confronted with objections from clergymen who oppose the traditional Eastern interpretation of reincarnation, where the soul undergoes multiple cycles of reincarnation until it destroys all aspects of individuality, New Age proponents assert that their teachings on reincarnation fit quite naturally within Christian doctrine. However, it is highly inappropriate for someone to profess Christianity while also believing in reincarnation. These two beliefs are fundamentally incompatible with each other. To be a true Christian entails staying firmly grounded in the teachings of the Church. Belief in reincarnation contradicts the very essence of the Christian faith as it dismisses the expectation of the resurrection of the dead, a fundamental tenet of Christianity. Embracing reincarnation would align with the portrayal of a foolish and senseless individual described by the psalmist lacking understanding and discernment. Quoting a passage from a narrative about an initiation into the mystical exploration of time, we can see how far human foolishness can go or, more precisely, how the devil mocks those who deem themselves too wise to take the teachings of the Gospel seriously. In Sacramento, Jane Houston encouraged everyone to recall past lives in various forms of existence. The gathering of nearly a thousand people enthusiastically imitated swimming as fish, crawled like reptiles, flew and climbed like birds and monkeys. The room transformed into a lively zoo, filled with diverse sounds and movements. Houston then urged them to reflect on their evolution as primitive humans, shedding their fur and developing into modern beings. After an intense and immersive exercise that lasted over an hour, the climax arrived. Houston directed them to embrace the next stage of their personal evolution, 
resulting in a jubilant transformation. The participants joyfully jumped, sometimes alone and sometimes in groups, ultimately joining hands and raising their voices together. The impact was electric. The room became a collective mass comprising housewives, therapists, artists, social workers, clergy, educators, doctors and nurses, all curious to uncover what lay hidden within their memories. They diligently walked on all fours, interacting and relishing the rediscovery of their deep-rooted past experiences. Despite the delirious nature of this New Age show, it is worth acknowledging a peculiar contrast. While some individuals swiftly criticize church teachings as uninspiring, dismissing them as mere lullabies for children, these very same individuals readily embrace doctrines devoid of logical reasoning, particularly when they contradict Christian principles. However, it cannot be concluded from this that reincarnation is only accepted by housewives and nurses or even doctors and educators with lower intellectual levels. While certain manifestations, like the one in Sacramento, seem questionable, simplistic, or even demonic to some, the angel of darkness presents them with another version of belief in reincarnation, garnished with explanations so sophisticated that they prefer to participate in lofty teachings, even if they don't understand them. For those who wish to identify as Christians yet still hold on to the belief in reincarnation, Christ speaks through the Holy Fathers who preach the resurrection of the dead. According to the decision of the Ecumenical Holy Synod, it is strictly prohibited for anyone to create, write, or teach an alternative statement of faith. This prohibition extends even to the mere contemplation of such ideas. Those who defy this decree by crafting another profession of faith, disseminating it for instructional purposes, or propagating a different creed among those seeking the truth, and turning away from errors of Hellenistic, Judaic, or any other heretical nature, will face severe consequences. If they hold positions as bishops or clergy, they will be stripped of their roles and responsibilities. If they are monks or lay people, they will be anathematized. We close with the perspective of an Orthodox clergy, Father Simeon Adrian, on the belief in reincarnation. Those who believe in reincarnation can no longer believe in the resurrection, in Christ. They are pagans, heretics or atheists and cannot have any communion with Christ, with the Church, willingly making themselves heirs of hell.